All of you intrepid reporters asked about the fossil dinosaur eggs found in Spain. Well, we aim to please, so this week we're going to make a giant omelette. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Chris Cinema Network, ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we set up in the utility room at the Big Valley Creation Science Museum when Harry wasn't looking so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazoo.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Chuby. As we say in Canada, I had a whack of people send me articles referring to the discovery of hundreds of dinosaur eggs in Spain. Now this is of course an old interest of mine, having personally studied many dozens of dinosaur eggs and a few egg clutches, as well as looking at the exhausting amount of reports and literature out there. Thanks to the many intrepid reporters who called our attention to this paper, I'd rather get flooded by too many people sending me the same article than to have no one send me an important article and we miss it in our weekly research. The find documents dozens of fossilized dinosaur egg clutches in the Tremp Formation in Spain. And there were some interesting points to be learned here. Celis et al. documented at least four different kinds of eggs, all in the same layer implying differing dinosaurs laying their eggs in the same area at the same time. There have been fossilized dinosaur eggs found there in 25 different stratigraphic horizons or rock layers. Now you can quickly see the researchers interpretation of the fossils being swayed by their evolutionary and deep time beliefs. Notice the subtle assumption that these rock layers represent time, not Noah's flood. But it's actually a common anti-creationist argument that dinosaur egg nests somehow refute Noah's flood. <laughs> what were the dinosaurs doing? Laying their eggs on the ocean floor? <laughs> and so we see the heart of the issue, which has been there for over 180 years. Deep time or Noah's flood? Are these dinosaur egg nests Difficult to interpret within the context of a worldwide flood? Nope. In fact, I think by the time this show is over, you'll see that a worldwide flood is probably a better interpretation than deep time. Let's start with the eggs themselves. Now, it should be noted that while the researchers documented four different kinds of eggs, and they assigned four different types of sauropod dinosaurs to those eggs, Dinosaur identification by the eggs is tricky at best. Why? Because though there are thousands of fossil eggs found, I I've personally seen many dozens, possibly hundreds. Though we find copious numbers of dinosaur eggs, embryos are exceedingly rare. When I show my hadrosaur egg to the children, one of the first questions they ask is, is there a baby dinosaur in there? I know there is not because when a dinosaur egg is found, one of the first things they do is x-ray the egg to see if there's an embryo inside. Why? Because if there is, the price for the egg will shoot up dramatically because embryos are so rare. So why are embryos so rare? Well, in short, because of the lack of deep time, no incubation. The embryos never developed. Now this makes sense within a catastrophic context. The eggs were laid, and then the mother and the eggs killed shortly thereafter. You see, when we read the biblical context, 
it appears that the flood encroached upon the land over many weeks before it even got high enough to float the ark. Now, reading the context implies that Noah's ark did not float until the 40th day. So during that time, the water was continually rising, yet superimposed on that would be the tides. So every 12 hours, there would be a tidal wave that was higher than the last. Then during the low tides, the freshly laid sediments would be exposed. And it was during these low tides that the dinosaurs would have walked around, leaving footprints, depositing eggs, because they could very well have been carrying eggs for weeks before they finally got to the point where they would ditch the eggs. In fact, the evidence itself speaks so loudly to this that some researchers have acknowledged it. Martinez et al., publishing in the journal Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, and Paleoecology, entitled their article, Dinosaur Nesting on Tidal Flats. The tidal flats they're referring to was the Tremp Formation in Spain. The same formation from which the re present report of dinosaurs, of uh, dozens of dinosaur eggs, comes from. Now, hold on a minute here. Tidal flats? Gee, that's exactly what I'm proposing here. Dinosaurs getting rid of their eggs on the fresh tidal flats during low tide. Why on earth would a dinosaur lay eggs on a tidal flat? That makes no sense whatsoever, except if it was the only place they could put them. These clusters of eggs were not laid in nests, but rather piles. We see the same thing over in Patagonia, Argentina, at the Alca Mahuevo site, where hundreds of sauropod eggs from the Saltosaurus were found. Now, this was one of the rare sites where a number of dinosaur embryos were found, but once again, the eggs were on mud flats tidal flats. Maybe the sauropods liked to lay their eggs there. Well, that's very doubtful for a number of reasons, as you will see in just a minute. Let's examine dinosaur nest structures first, and then come back to this question. Let's take a look at the oviraptor nests to start. Now, it's an interesting story how the oviraptor got its name. The first oviraptors found were found in association with dinosaur eggs. The evolutionary scientists, of course, think in terms of survival of the fittest. So they assumed the oviraptor was stealing the eggs for food. And thus they named it the egg thief. Ova for, th for egg, raptor for thief. You remember I mentioned that dinosaur embryos are exceedingly rare? Well, this was no exception. Later on, other eggs, just like the ones found with the oviraptor, were found with embryos inside. Guess which dinosaur it was? Some of you will have guessed. It was the oviraptor. This wasn't a dinosaur stealing eggs for food. It was the mother buried alive on her eggs. Now, for this reason and the fact that dinosaur eggs had been misidentified in the past, typically dinosaur eggs will be given a name rather than the identity of an actual dinosaur. Because it's so rare to make a solid connection between the dinosaur type that laid the egg and the egg itself. Now, coming back to the oviraptors, let's examine their nesting habits. Notice that this is what the dinosaurs wanted to do. They want to lay their eggs in a circle. Notice also that they laid their eggs in pairs, two at a time. Now, we don't know if they had two oviducts or what, but it would appear that several dinosaurs laid eggs two at a time. So the dinosaur would apparently stand in the middle. It would lay two eggs, rotate, lay another two eggs, rotate, lay another two eggs, etc. Sometimes it would lay another layer, sometimes a third layer of eggs. Now, if you think about it, these dinosaurs were smart. They're not a small, light bird which can sit on the eggs and incubate them and not crush them. But if they lay them in a circle like this, they can sit in the middle of the circle and incubate the eggs, keeping them warm. 
Oh, that's a major clue. If you're familiar with the debate about whether or not the dinosaurs were warm-blooded or cold-blooded, there's a good reason to think they may very well have been warm-blooded, and the mother would sit in the middle to warm the eggs. So, this is what the dinosaurs wanted to do. You remember I mentioned that several oviraptors had now been found in association with their eggs? One example of several was this oviraptor, found buried alive, still sitting on its nest. You can see two layers of eggs underneath her. Everything was found except her head. This oviraptor was nicknamed Big Mama, even though paleontologists are now thinking it might be the male who is sitting on the nest. This one was named Big Auntie, also buried alive, still sitting on the nest. Even the evolutionists agree this was a flash flood that buried these dinosaurs. Now, I saw an IMAX film a few years back where they discussed and depicted these brooding oviraptors in a valley somewhere and, oh no, here comes the flash flood. No, it wasn't like that at all, because these dinosaurs were found on tidal flats, not some valley somewhere. The tidal flats, as they are found all over the world, are huge, provincial in size, sometimes extending across multiple continents. Now, this particular find was found in Mongolia. So you have flash floods producing tidal flats, which are burying dinosaur eggs and sometimes even the dinosaurs themselves. But wait, wouldn't a flash flood move the eggs? Wouldn't a flash flood destroy the nest? Research that the late Professor Emmy Clark and myself conducted in the flume at Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, clearly demonstrated otherwise to our amazement. We took chicken eggs, which have only a slight negative buoyancy. In other words, they just barely sink in water. We placed those eggs on a surface of sand with different orientations to the flow of water. Now we were able to achieve water flowing at speeds of up to 16 feet, five meters per second flowing through that flume. That's twice the speed of the tsunamis that hit Indonesia and Japan. Water velocities that high did not even budge the eggs. In fact, the flow would scour sediments from in front of the egg and deposit it in behind the egg, buttressing its position. But yet water flowing at a mere one meter per second can deposit enormous amounts of dirt in a very short amount of time, burying the eggs without even budging them from their positions. And it can bury them in minutes. So we can demonstrate by experimentation, the rapid accumulation of sediments, dirt, in flows of water. And I would say these deposits were being produced by the many tidal waves as the worldwide flood got higher and higher over months. I believe we can see the results of these tidal waves and deposits in the fossil record. This hadrosaur egg nest was found in China. Now, apparently the hadrosaur also wanted to lay its eggs in the circle, but notice what happened in the time that it took the dinosaur to lay its eggs. This is good evidence mud was being deposited as the eggs were being laid, as each egg was higher in the sediments than the last. Does this help the arguments of deep time? Or does it lend credibility to the catastrophe scenario? The dinosaur was laying its eggs apparently as rushing water was dumping large amounts of mud and sand around its ankles. I would suggest this is good evidence of catastrophe, not long periods of time. But then we get to this very unusual cluster of eggs from the Two Medicine Formation of Montana. Evidently, this dinosaur was dropping its eggs while on the move. Now, what I find very humorous here is that the anti-creationists have railed on me over this particular clutch of eggs. Now, it's true, I did mistakenly refer to these eggs as oviraptor, not truodont on a television program. And the skeptics jumped up and down and got real excited over my mistake, somehow thinking that they had discredited what I was saying. This is another classic example of nitpicking to miss the point. Truodonts don't lay their eggs in a row. The Trudons are, again, one of those dinosaurs who lays their eggs by the pair. But these eggs 
are clearly not a nest. Evidently, these eggs were ditched in high stress conditions. And considering they were buried in what was clearly water deposited sediments, I would say it was a flood it was running from. The skeptics provided no explanation for this odd situation, while my suggestion is perfectly feasible. Now, one skeptic at least acknowledged that, yeah, it does appear it was fleeing from something, but oh, it wasn't a flood, oh no. Others mocked and said it was impossible for a dinosaur to lay eggs while running. Well, while the word I used was hyperbole, the point is, it was not sitting there making a nest. It was moving and under high stress. This is hardly impossible. In fact, this betrays the ignorance of the skeptics. It is a well-known phenomena that animals will even give live birth when startled or frightened. Even humans will suddenly give birth under high stress conditions. Ah, oh, but that Juby guy's crazy. His scenario is impossible. Ha! What's he going to suggest next? That something got fossilized in the act of giving birth? Oh, <laughs> that Juby guy's crazy. As it turns out, even the sauropod dinosaurs wanted to lay their eggs in circles, much like the oviraptors, as we can see from this dinosaur egg site in France. But evidently, the sauropods were not able to do what they wanted. I would suggest that what's gone on here is that the sauropods were trying to follow their instinct, trying to lay a nest, when they got interrupted by the next incoming tidal wave. At which point, they ditched the eggs they had left, which is why there is a combination of circular nests and piles. Now, mostly what we find is dinosaur egg piles. The dinosaur just got rid of the eggs. And some had probably been carrying the eggs long enough that the embryos had actually developed to a certain degree. But coming back to the tremp formation eggs, the eggs are often found in different levels, something like the hadrosaur nest we saw a few moments ago. Now, in this particular case, titanosaur eggs were found cut through by what is called the bedding plane, a layer of rock. It, wait a minute. Those layers are supposedly laid down over vast amounts of time. I, that's the whole premise of deep time, to explain away the rock layers around the world with an alternate interpretation involving deep time and not a worldwide flood. These dinosaur eggs were polystrate fossils. Now, what's a polystrate fossil? A polystrate fossil is best explained using fossil plants like this one from Tennessee. It cuts through many strata of rock. Poly for many, many, straight for the strata of or rock layers. It is a polystrate fossil. Obviously, the top of the plant is not going to stick around for even tens of years, let alone thousands or millions of years. Therefore, it is quite safe to conclude that these layers do not represent time, but a flood. And even the skeptics will agree with me on that point. So, coming back to our polystrate dinosaur eggs, authors Moritella and Powell even suggested back in 1994 that perhaps this titanosaur even came back the following year and laid eggs in the same nesting spot. Are we to believe that the first egg sat there unbroken for an entire year, getting slowly buried? No predators, no accidentally getting stepped upon, etc. Now, the more likely explanation, far more feasible, is that these eggs were being laid down as the water was laying down dirt around them. It buried the first egg most of the way in the short time it took for the dinosaur to then lay another two eggs. This implies catastrophe, less than ideal conditions for the dinosaur to be laying its eggs. This does not support deep time. In fact, at the Tremp Formation, as well as the Patagonia Formation, the Mongolian Formation, etc., there are multiple layers of dinosaur eggs found. Uh, in the Tremp Formation, it's some 1,000 vertical feet of layers that have dinosaur eggs. Now, it is simply assumed that each of those layers represents time, rather than, say, 
separate tidal waves and tidal deposits during a worldwide flood. The same assumptions are made with dinosaur tracks. For example, most dinosaur track sites have multiple levels of tracks in layers stacked on top of each other. So it's simply interpreted that each layer represents a year. Yet at the Grand Cache coal mine in Alberta, we see the same phenomena, multiple levels of dinosaur tracks. Yet, if you look closely, you'll see upside down polystrate fossil trees. The trees have been buried upside down, cutting through the many layers of dinosaur tracks. Obviously, the different levels do not represent different years, as the tree would rot and break off instead of being slowly buried over many years while upside down. <laughs> and the skeptics would agree with me on that. We, we see these bedding planes cutting through these alleged dinosaur nests. You can even see it in this nest from the Tremp Formation in Spain. The eggs are in different levels, and the researchers were attributing this to the dinosaur digging a hole and then laying its eggs in the hole. Oh, fair enough. But we must ask, what's with the bedding planes then? Perhaps there was no hole at all, but the eggs were being dropped into rapidly rising mud, being deposited by water as the dinosaur was dropping its eggs. So we see that multiple levels in stratum of egg nests does not support deep time at all. But considering that those layers are tidal flats, everything about them indicates they were laid down by water. The eggs themselves are often polystrate fossils, which were obviously buried rapidly. We're talking minutes. I mean, how else would you bury alive a dinosaur sitting on its nest? In minutes, that's how. We see that while dinosaurs wanted to lay actual nests of eggs, this is actually a rare occurrence. What we typically see are piles of eggs, sometimes even showing evidence of being laid under high stress conditions in a line. Even the sauropods did this. What researchers refer to as linear nests, which are not nests at all. Everything about dinosaur eggs indicates a giant watery catastrophe and does not support millions of years at all. And this evidence is found all over the world. That worldwide flood was judgment from an angry God, our Creator who was angry over our wickedness. And just like God warned the world through Noah of judgment to come, He warned us of another judgment to come, the great white throne judgment. Just as those who ignored the warnings given by Noah died, Jesus warned that you must be born again for your name to be written in the book of life. We see the evidence of God's judgment in the rock record. So we know that it is true for the past. You better believe it's true for the very near future. Today is the day to turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness and salvation from the judgment to come. Stick around, we'll be right back after this short break. This show is sponsored in part by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum at bvcsm.com. And by Genesis Park, where you can pre-order your own beautiful hard-covered copy of the Chronicles of Dinosauria, the history and mystery of dinosaurs and man. Funny, Fast and Furious. Ian's Crevo rants cover a multitude of topics in an easy to understand comical way. Complicated subjects that normally make your brain hurt, hurt a lot less when Ian explains them while wearing his anti-government mind reading equipment. Have questions about carbon-14 dating, natural selection, thermodynamics, or what on earth is he doing there? Three volumes of rants on DVD. Take your pick for $15 each plus shipping and handling or order all three as a package and save yourself 10 bucks. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. for me?
Patrick from Nova Scotia wrote in, Dear Ian, I remember hearing you mention the need to calibrate the radiometric dating systems in one of your YouTube videos. In my experience as a programmer, the first time running a new system, e.g. program, you ought to walk through the process and check and make sure each step works as you expect. Otherwise, there can be underlying surprises you may not know about. When it comes to radiometric dating, it just seems like a good idea for the rocks that can be dated by historical events to also be dated radiometrically to verify the accuracy of radiometric dating methods. I've heard of creationist findings regarding this. Do you know whether the secular community has published on calibration studies besides the apparently common residual carbon-14? Thanks for writing in, Patrick. Uh, there have been no calibration studies done that I know of. The only calibration that has been done has been to run tests on rocks of which we know the age. How do we know the age? <laughs> well, evolutionary theory, of course. The only modern day calibrations would be tests that were run trying to determine the age of rocks or rocks which were encased in lava flows, for example. Uh, back in 1968, Funkhauser and Naughton documented their attempts to date what are called inclusions, rocks that were captured in a lava flow. Now, this volcanic lava flow was known to have erupted in 1800. The reason we know it erupted in 1800 is because people saw it. Yet, those 170-year-old lavas returned radio dates of between 160 million to 3 billion years old. So, which age is correct? 170 years old? 160 million years old? Or 3 billion years old? Now, this study happened to be conducted on rocks of which we knew the ages. So, if the study obviously returned the wrong dates for that rock, why on earth should we believe them for the rocks of which we don't know the age? So this is just one of many examples of, shall we say, accidental calibration. Calibration which only shows that radio dates of billions of years equals an actual age of less than 200 years. Observe the backpedaling and explaining away of these radio dates as an anomaly, contamination, etc. As the deep time community simply cannot accept that radiometric dating might be completely out to lunch. Hopefully I'll make a YouTube game show out of the radiometric dating game, but that's project number 4,563,395. And I'm only in the two billions right now on the list. Well, that's it for this week's show. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. You can send in your questions, comments, letter bombs, and proprietary industrial secrets to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com or send us a tweet at genesisweek, or you can go to genesisweek.com, which is our YouTube channel, find the most recent video, and post a comment or visit our Facebook page. It was our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you next week. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office, Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, k 2 k 2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org.